Hi, I'm James McGuire, and on today's eSpeaks, we're talking about multi-cloud computing, which is one of the most important trends driving business today, but it's also one of the most challenging and confusing trends. To provide insight into that, I'm joined by someone who knows a lot about the topic. With me is David Linthicum, cloud, Chief Cloud Strategy Officer at Deloitte Consulting. Uh, David, thanks so much for talking with us today. Well, thank you very much for having me on, James. I appreciate it. You know, let's talk about multi-cloud. I, I think there's been a, a lot of change in, in the world of cloud computing. I, I think back to the early days of, of AWS, it was just a few startups, a few uh, you know, developers. Now cloud is you know, way more mature. It feels like multi-cloud is the default deployment, but that doesn't mean the companies necessarily know what they're doing. Uh, what, what is your sense of how comfortable companies are with their deployment? Are they, are they mostly okay? Are they confused and challenged? What, what, what's your take? I would think they found they're in multi-cloud by accident. And so that by default, they're confused and challenged. So in other words, uh, in many instances, uh, they didn't know people were leveraging some other cloud brand besides the main one, which they partnered with several years ago. And suddenly they showed up at the door and IT was handed a bucket full of Microsoft when they standardized on AWS. And you know, suddenly they had to figure out how to manage and deploy and operate these various systems. And right. so that's one. And the other one would be just uh, the fact for the last two years, we were heads down on the pandemic and many organizations now working remotely were typically decoupled from each other and not a lot of core planning uh, that was occurring. And they lommed onto what they considered the best of breed cloud services, whatever cloud that was. Mm -hmm. And suddenly by the innovation and development that just occurred, they naturally moved into multi-cloud. So, suddenly they find themselves in this situation. They really didn't plan for it in many instances. And now they're backing up and trying to figure out what infrastructure is needed, what security is needed, you know, in essence, get the piece parts put together to make it work. You know, and of course, uh, one of the problems is as they, as they back up and figure it out, they're spending large sums of money. Um, you wrote this really great article for eWeek, which I will put into the description of this video. And it's, uh, it's about cloud best practices that the public cloud providers prefer you not know. And I think one of, one of the points you made is that when you, when you pursue the multi-cloud strategy, you're pretty much on your own because you know, AWS doesn't really care about the Azure instance and, and vice versa. And so you know, the, the poor company in the middle is sort of caught between it all. I mean, I, what is your sense of, of some big pain points in the world of multi-cloud? Yeah, I think you just hit upon it. That's the big one. And so in other words, the, the hyperscalers uh, obviously want you to work in their walled garden and that's, that's natural. And in many instances, that may be the path of least resistance in terms of the fact that their stuff works together and they are able to provide it through a single part of support, things like that. So moving into multi-cloud, you kind of hit this as well, you're on your own. And so in other words, the cloud providers will help you get their aspect of their silos up and running, their walled garden working and support you in those. But as far as common security mechanisms that run across cloud, common management and monitoring, common data repositories, uh, federated uh, applications that run across cloud providers, you know, federated containerization, things like that, things that enterprises are building these days, mm -hmm. you need to figure that out yourself. You're, you're not going to be able to go back to a vendor to make that happen. You certainly engage consultants um, to come in and, you know, show you what it is, but it's still kind of an emerging best practice, best practices technology. And people are trying to, are trying to gain traction on that right now. And multi-cloud is hard at the end of the day. It's very complex, lots of moving parts. You need lots of different talents in place and enterprises are realizing that that's the trade-off in moving into a cloud choice kind of a platform, which is what multi-cloud is. Do you think there is a lot of spend wasted? I mean, do you think there's, there are people in the C-suite right now pulling their hair out and going, why are we spending this vast fortune on multi-cloud and we're, we're not actually really getting that much or getting as much as we need? Is, is there a ton of spend wasted or not necessarily? Uh, there can be. Um, it really depends on the company. I think that the C-suites are seeing a couple of things. Number one, when we're moving into a multi-cloud deployment, when we try to operationalize it, just the sheer complexity of the fact that we're dealing with, you know, 40, 60 percent more cloud services that are under management is going to lead to additional expense. And so in other words, we need, need uh, uh, distributed and different technologies, uh, technologies and talents around uh, to support the multi-cloud environment. We need to be able to figure out how we're going to build common security services, governance services, things like that. And the operationalizing of the multi-cloud is where the sticker shock comes in. And that's when these rebranded re budgets are sent up and they say, we're operating in a multi-cloud environment. We need another 
uh, 60, 70 percent in budgetary dollars to operate this thing. And that's where they're kicking things back. And that's actually where a lot of CIOs in many instances are hitting the brakes and saying we can't afford operationalizing a multi-cloud. It's just too complex. We haven't done the planning we need. We haven't done the complexity mediation we need. And therefore, we're just going to uh, stay with a single cloud. We're going to standardize on a single cloud. And that's the way we're going to move forward. The trade-off there would be you're giving up innovation. So in other words, you're not providing those who are building these tools that are really driving your business with the core innovative technology that they need to solve those problems because we're limiting them to a walled garden, either AWS, Microsoft, Google, um, you know, Oracle, IBM, what have you. And by doing so, we're limiting uh, the ability to have them create the best solutions available. And so that's a trade-off right now. We're, we're trying to figure that out. I think corporations are trying to figure that out. What about that, that belief? I'd, I'd like to get your take on whether this is a myth or not, that companies think, oh, if I'm in a multi-cloud scenario, I can sort of play the vendors off one another because they know I've got a number of providers. But the problem with that, I, I think, is that, well, I've got this instance with Azure and it really is, it's, it's, it's really good. It works well with Azure. I'm not sure I could do it the same with, with Google Cloud. So, you know, the, the various providers realize, you know, you're not as portable as, as you think you might be. Multi-cloud doesn't really solve the question of vendor lock-in or, or, or does it? No, it doesn't. I think that's a surprise because I always see that on the list of why people are moving to multi-cloud to avoid vendor, vendor lock-in. It'll provide you a choice. In other words, if we have different hyperscalers that are part of the service portfolio, we're able to go to different storage systems and different database systems, different security systems, things like that. But once we leverage the cloud native features in those particular cloud brands, we're, we're kind of stuck. Because we, if we decouple an application that's leveraging security services and performance services, container services on a particular cloud provider and try to move it over to another, we have to rewrite those systems or refactor those systems to be native on those other providers. So, and really kind of the cloud providers know that. So I think, you know, threatening them with moving um, because, you know, if you don't get a better price, I, I think uh, in many instances, that's a false option. Mm -hmm. I mean, even the even the idea of application portability is also a myth, and that you know I'll just move this from you know you know Google Cloud to Azure. It's like you're not going to really move that application, are you? Well, you can always move an application with enough money and time. <laughs> you know that's what right. you know that's what I tell my clients. But the reality is, you're trying to get value to that. So, in other words, if we're going to make something cloud native, by definition, that's going to be very difficult to unseat and move to a, move to another system. In fact. If you look at the pragmatic approach, it, it's it's unmovable, you know, from a cost perspective standpoint. And so, um, people need to understand that if they're localizing stuff with particular cloud native services, the trade off is going to be you're locked in that particular cloud. That doesn't necessarily limit you. And those the cloud providers we have uh, these days are doing a good job, and you know, maintaining performance, and they're a good value in the marketplace. But moving it from place to place, you know, as you needed, that that really is uh, is unpragmatic. Mm -hmm. So, all right, if, if, if a company calls you up, they're feeling frantic and they, they, they need some help. And if, if, you, if, you, if you'd give some pithy advice, what would be a, a couple of, of really key pieces of advice that companies need to hear about managing multi-cloud? Yeah, it's really about building things outside of the cloud in the middle. And so now these things may run on clouds, but in AdWS, Microsoft or Google, but the reality is we're trying to be, build common services that are able to run across clouds. You know, typically it's going to be security, management, monitoring, governance, all these other systems. And it takes a lot of planning to do that because you have to have close coordination with those who are standing up applications, how you're migrating systems, how you're going to operationalize those systems moving forward. But the reality is if you spend the time in planning how these common services are going to run, who's going to run them and how they're going to run, where they're going to run, um, you'll be head and shoulders above everybody else in the cloud. The big thing we have right now is a lack of planning. It's done in a very ad hoc way. Um, in many instances, they found themselves in multi-cloud by default, as we discussed at the beginning of the show. Mm -hmm. And in doing that, the only way to prevent that is to look for common things you're able to carry across applications, cloud providers. And that's really the best advice right now. And if you do that, your chances are you're going to be successful. Well, let's take a look at, at, at the future of, of multi-cloud. I mean, when will it be easy? And will we ever attain that mythical state called a single pane of glass to manage all the multiple clouds? Just click, 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 and it all, it all fits together. Will, will that ever be real? Yeah, we are seeing some uh, 
promising technologies that are appearing on the horizon. I mean, the AI ops tools that are out there, and this is a huge market inflection that's occurring right now. Uh, they have not only the ability to look at multi-cloud and many, many cloud services through a single pane of glass, but you're able to deal with these services through abstraction and through automation, which makes many very different, very complex services look very simple to those who are operating the systems. You know, as we discussed earlier, we're reading, reaching an operational complexity challenge. Actually, the AI ops uh, world is calling it the complexity wall, where we just can't be get beyond it. So if we're able to abstract those various systems, we need fewer people. We need uh, basically a single, single base of talent, not necessarily people who are experts in the particular cloud providers out there and how you're gonna run the management monitoring system, security systems, things like that. So that's promising. The ability to deal with common security services that work cross clouds. So the security managers out there are starting to build technologies that go across a cloud versus within a cloud. Everybody makes security services for a particular cloud but not everybody makes securities that are able to cross cloud. Governance systems, directory systems, identity access management systems, and really kind of focusing on the fact that cloud providers, um, not necessarily commoditizing, but are gonna be pushed a little lower in the stack as we're building these cross cloud services. And you're gonna find that the innovation is gonna be occurring at the cloud level, of course, but within these cross cloud services. And I think some of the cloud providers may jump in. They may say, well, listen, look, we'll, we're gonna provide these cross cloud services. We're gonna be able to take our walled garden and make it work with other walled gardens, you know, providing these capabilities to enable our clients into the multi-cloud because they understand that that's the best way to protect their business. It's really interesting about the, the idea of the, the cross cloud services providers and, and that idea, I haven't, haven't heard as much about that. Um, so, for example, one security vendor would would build a solution that may work well, tie together all the clouds. Is that is that happening quite a bit, or is that still ahead of the curve? It's still ahead of the curve a bit. They're called security managers. We're starting to see them appear out there, and really, what they do is instead of providing every security feature that you need, identity management, uh, encryption, things like that. They're able to operate across these siloed security systems. In other words, they're able to abstract the security systems from AWS, from Microsoft, and from Google, and allow you to interface with them using a single interface, a single pane of glass. So we can deal with encryption using a single concept, a single entity. We can deal with identity access management, multi-factor authentication, things instead of deploying that in whatever particular proprietary ways that the cloud provider wants you to leverage, we're able to do it in one single way, which is able to automatically uh, propagate across the cloud providers. And I think that's, uh, that's a huge uh, step forward. And I think we're gonna start seeing a lot of these technologies start to rise up, certainly as the market explodes, which probably 2020, end of this year, 2020, 2023 will be the, more the explosion of that. The, the explosion of the cross cloud services or, or of cloud in general? The first clouds exploded, they closed ex, uh, explosion across cloud services, the ability for enterprises to realize that they really should be looking at these services that span clouds versus things that are native to a particular cloud. That's going to be the refocusing going forward. You know, I've always wondered on that, the idea of it's, it's native to one cloud or it spans clouds. You think at some point the hyperscalers themselves would realize, you know what, We've got to break down to admit that this multi-cloud world exists and we have to actually cater to it, which I see, I see, I know why they wouldn't want to do that, but it seems like there would be an advantage. And I think about, you know, the rise of Snowflake is partially because it is cloud agnostic. What if one of the hyperscalers said, you know, we want to build our own our own Snowflake and, and, and be as cloud agnostic as we can and get some of that more Snowflake business. Does that make any sense or am I, am I, am I out to lunch here? Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. And, you know, it's funny, one of my predictions before the big cloud conferences is that they're finally going to start, you know, supporting multi-cloud deployments. And that, and that really kind of never happens in a formal way. But it is happening, happening informally. They understand that their clients are looking for choice in cloud, and they're typically going to have to coexist with their competitors when they exist within their, their enterprises. So they're building clouds and building cloud services that are really gonna accommodate that. You know, whether it's a Kubernetes cluster, the ability to deal with distributed database, the ability to deal with, uh, um, you know, core heterogeneity of uh, short-lived services and microservices that exist across cloud, the ability to have orchestration layers that run across cloud. Those capabilities are there. They're typically not advertised. The good cloud engineers know how to leverage them. And so that's one path. And I think moving forward, um, we're gonna start seeing the hyperscalers start to jump on the bandwagon. You have innovation that's occurring. 
And at the same time, we're hitting an innovation wall. We're hitting feature saturation within the public cloud providers where there's not many things that are left to be built, you know, that there's a market for to build them. So they're, they're improving the existing stuff. That being the case, they're gonna see the multi-cloud market explode. That's where the market is. That's where the people are going to buy their stuff. And they're gonna start accommodating that market. I don't know when that's going to be. I keep predicting it's happening. It's, it hasn't happened yet. Uh, but mm -hmm. let's hope for uh, the best in 2023, 2024. Mm. All right, la la last question I promise. The idea of artificial intelligence and buying it from the hyperscalers or buying it from maybe a smaller third party. It seems like a, the big cloud providers are in, in position to really own that that really burgeoning AI market by selling their own AI services. Do you think it, l looking ahead that AI will be mainly purchased from the hyperscalers or will they, will they not win that war? I, I think it will. And the reason why is they're able to spend more money on the R&D development in the AI uh, arena uh, than some of the other smaller players. You got to remember that, uh, you know, we're following the innovation and the innovation is typically occurring around who has the largest R&D dollars. You know, as a CTO of different uh, product companies over the years, um, that's your ability to gain into the market and access different uh, levels of scale. And AI systems, they need to scale, they need to have features and functions, they need to be usable, integration with databases, integration with the basic cloud services. And the cloud providers are in a better position to spend the money and to do that than the third party players. I think the third party players will end up uh, providing utility services, you know, unique, uh, unique niche capabilities that you'll wanna add on to those systems. But as far as having the core AI system that everybody wants to run, that's gonna drive my business, that's gonna come from the hyperscalers. Hmm. David, you said it. There was a lot of interesting stuff. Uh, thank you so much. And it's going to be a very interesting sector to uh, watch. I uh, hope you come back and talk to us again sometime. Always here. Thank you, James.